Welcome. Greetings from Baltimore, Maryland, the third evening of the 80th Convention of the Episcopal Church. I'm happy to be here to report to you today. Today, frankly, was far less grueling than yesterday. It was complicated, I have to admit, though, with the announcement of the death of Nelson Pinder. I received the call this morning uh, from Cressida Jackson, who had heard uh, from people back at St. John the Baptist Church. And um, so I immediately got in touch with Marion. I told the presiding bishop it was announced in the House of Bishops, prayers were offered uh, on his behalf and for the half of his family. So for many of us, we are in the midst of the busyness and at the same time, genuinely grieving the loss of an embodied legacy particularly in the life of Central Florida, both in terms of the community of Orlando, but also very, very much in the diocese and because of his role in uh, Union for Black Episcopalians and his fights for civil rights, is someone who is in fact a part of the history of the Episcopal Church in the United States especially. So I must and could not uh, fail to mention uh, that is a part of what happened today, probably one of the more momentous things that happened. And we are in the midst of right now planning all of the funeral arrangements and I will keep the diocese specifically informed about those as they are put together. You should know that in terms of business, um, the resolution that received a lot of controversy around the condemnation of crisis pregnancy centers was finally in the House of Bishops overwhelmingly defeated uh, by at least a 30% margin. Everybody considered it an overstatement and uh, the support for it was very, very minimal. By contrast, that kind of nuanced thinking was not applied to a similar kind of resolution, only it was around support for abortion rights. And even though it passed overwhelmingly, a number of people who had objected to it had, it's one of those situations where people came up to them after it was over and said, well, actually, I agreed with you. And what that says is that that's a resolution that will definitely need to be rewritten at the next general convention in two years. Because frankly, it, that kind of abortion access does not represent the position of the Episcopal Church. It's the Episcopal Church's position is far more nuanced than that. And in fact, one of the comments that was made in House of Bishops was the fact that none of these kinds of resolutions are even remotely help, helpful. It doesn't actually help a pastor in a situation deal with the complex relationships and impact of what happens when you're talking about things like unwanted pregnancies. It does not help even with the Episcopal Church's position. In other words, they're not helpful and in fact only complicate things more. It's clear that there are people in the House of Bishops that are tired of resolutions that do nothing more than sort of drive people to the corners of the opposite of debates rather than trying to think carefully and helpfully about what we could do in the midst of the situation in which we find ourselves. So I can guarantee you that that will be a part of the docket for the next general convention meeting. A couple of things um, needed to be ratified today. As some of you know, there is a kind of merger that has taken place between General Theological Seminary and Virginia Theological Seminary, so that in a sense, the General Seminary campus uh, in Chelsea, New York City, will be in many ways an extension site for Virginia uh, Seminary, which is in Alexandria, that was approved so that was one of the things that we talked about today. Another is the reestablishing of the Standing Commission on Ecumenical Relations. Uh, that was dissolved in the past couple, two or three years, and yet it's important, uh, an important part of the role that the Episcopal Church plays, both in ecumenical as well as interfaith dialogue, and especially in those places where Christians are in a minority and the Episcopal Church is present, that kind of interfaith, interrelational dialogue is a part of their day-to-day -day life. It may not be something that some of you are particularly interested in, but it's a vital piece of the life of some Christians on many places in this planet. Of course, another thing that happened today with the election of a new president of the House of Deputies yesterday was that Gay Jennings was honored for her 10 years of service. 
and therefore those plans of wrapping up her tenure as president, in essence, are in full swing. I think those are the things that I want to try to call to your attention about what happened today. Other things are occurring. There's some extended conversations, particularly in the House of Bishops, about what our future is going to be in terms of how we think about how we relate to the changing political and cultural landscape here in the United States. There is still conversation about what we need to do with the resolution that I mentioned yesterday around trying to create some clear paths for liturgical revision and at the same time upholding the memorialization of the 79 prayer book. But all of that is very much still in process as well as the budget, which we will finally, I think, vote and clear tomorrow because of course tomorrow is the last day. That means tomorrow night is going to be the last of these and then when I get back home, all of our deputation will be meeting with Eric Guzman, who is our media director, to put together a video that you will be able to listen to that will have all of the voices of our deputation on it, with hopefully a very concise uh, summation of what's happened here at the 80th, generation, 80th General Convention of the Episcopal Church. Thank you for watching, and you will see me tomorrow night. Thank you so much. God bless you.